All right. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, I'm really excited to be introducing Jesse Egner, who will be sharing his work. As a reminder, this event is part of the Lost Festivals hosted by Lacuna Studios in the Canary Islands, which was unfortunately moved online due to coronavirus. Um, but you can, you can still view their online galleries and check out other programmings they've done in their, in their website. I can drop the website in the chat, but it's lacunafestivals.com. And also after the talk, you'll have the opportunity, we'll have the opportunity to do a Q&A. So if you have any questions, feel free to drop it in the chat or wait after the talk and you can vocalize your question. Um, gonna give a little brief bio about Jesse before he takes it away. So Jesse is an artist working primarily with photography and video. After taking, um, often taking the form of playful and absurd portraiture of himself and other individuals, his work explores various themes such as queerness, disidentification, queer corporeality, and the uncanny. He was born in 1993 in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and is currently based in Brooklyn, New York. His work has recently been included in exhibitions such as um, the one in the Photographic Center Northwest in Seattle, Washington, El Rincon Social in Box 13 Art Space in Houston, Texas, Columbia College in Chicago, Illinois, Academy, um, <laughs> Academy Art Museum in Eastern Maryland, I can never say this word, the Lacuna Festivals in the Canary Islands, and the Pingyao International Photography Festival in Shanxi, China. His photographs have been featured in publications such as um, Soft Lighting, Platforma Minima, Photographers Forum, and CNN Style. He received his BA from Millersville University of Pennsylvania in 2016, and recently graduated with his MFA in photography at Parsons School of Design this week. Yes, shout out Parsons yeah. people. <laughs> um, yeah, a couple of us graduated. Um, so you can, you can follow Jesse and his work. I'll link his website, um, portfolio, and his Instagram in the chat. Jesse, the floor is yours. All right, let me go ahead and uh, share my screen here. All right, y'all see just like a, a blank screen, right? All right, yep. good. good. Um, so here's here's uh, my website and Instagram. I'm just gonna put that up here real quick. Uh, so thank you all for coming. Um, and yeah, like as Steven said, this is uh, like an event part of the um, the Lost Festival hosted by um, uh, Lacuna Studios, which I was really looking forward to the the potential to possibly like go actually to it in person, but that did not happen. Um, so I'm going to start with like giving like a little bit of context and kind of like mentioning like the framework that influences my practice. Um, and then I'm going to talk about some uh, projects that I've worked on like over the last couple of years up until like what I've been working on right now. Um, so I am from um, Lancaster, Pennsylvania, which is this like small town in the middle of Amish country. Uh, and I, I was always like a big kid and I was like really like othered because of that, you know, experiencing lots of like you know, like exclusion and bullying and all that fun stuff. Um, and then so when I started getting like a little older and I realized that I was gay, I was like, oh, great. Just like another thing just to like make me feel different. Just like, you know, throw it on the pile. Um, and so like because of this, I went through this like really intense like internal struggle um, because like I already knew that like this was gonna be like a problem for me. Um, and like, so like when I started to come out like in, in, uh, in high school, this was like around like 2009. This was when like America was kind of warming up to queer people. This was like the upswing of states starting to legalize same-sex marriage and then leading up to the whole country legalizing it. And I also saw some of like uh, some of my peers coming out and being like welcomed and even like celebrated. Um, they were becoming like like the shopping buddies or like the envies, you know, like girls being like, oh my God, all the good ones, all the hot ones are gay, you know, like that, that whole thing. Um, but when I came out, that wasn't my experience. And like, I, w I was rejected even by like other like gay people, almost as if I was like trespassing into this like exclusive cool club or something. Uh, and then like, as I entered the dating world, I was like first handedly like experiencing this rejection as well. And so like, because of this, like I kind of established this like really precarious relationship with myself and my identity, you know, like because of this like struggle that was going on, um, and like really kind of yeah like put this like weird like framework in place 
So when I decided to move to New York City for grad school, I had this like built up expectation of New York City as this like queer utopia. Um, and like people tell me like, oh my God, you're gonna make so many gay friends, you're gonna go on so many dates, you're gonna have a boyfriend in no time. Um, and like also like when I was coming out, it was when the It Gets Better project was like really popular. So there are like lots of these narratives of like, oh, all you gotta do is grow up, move out of your small town and everything's gonna be fine. You're gonna be happy, everything's gonna be great. So um, this is a photo I took in uh, the summer of 2018, a few months after moving to New York City. And I first wanna start off by noting that like up until this point, I really stayed away from personal work like ex especially self-portraiture. Like anytime I had a self-portrait assignment in undergrad, I needed to do it like as abstract as possible. I was like, I don't want people to see me. I don't want to like put pictures of myself up there for people to see, like absolutely not. And I feel like, I feel like, like this kind of like came from that really weird relationship I had with myself and my physical appearance where like I kind of wanted to repress myself. So after moving to New York City, I kind of like realized this like idea of queer utopia that I had built up really was not the reality. Um, I was feeling really frustrated by this like social climate of like the gay male community in New York City, where it's so large that um, they can be like really clicky and really choose to support those that only like only those that they are attracted to. Um, so this like idea of like fit white able bodied men became like the conventional standards of you know gay male attraction. It's like the poster child for gayness. And like so as I did not fit into that attraction, uh, into that like kind of like attraction, I felt like left out. Um, so I was thinking about like, like, um, uh, how like these kind of expectations have been adapted from like heteronormativity and has become like homonormativity. And I was thinking about how like these are being projected onto me and other gay men and queer people. Um, so in this photo, uh, my phone is like haphazardly attached to my face with some tape and rubber bands and open on the phone is Grindr, which is an app that gay men use to meet other gay men usually for hookups. Um, and I felt like this platform really exemplified like the projection of these expectations. Uh, one one like good example for this is, um, this used to be more common, but it's not as common anymore, is the phrase, uh, no femmes, no fats, no Asians, no blacks, that people would like just put like on their profiles um, or like some combination of those, basically completely like writing off groups of people. And now they, they still do stuff like that, but they use like a little bit more tricky language, like fit guys only or only attracted to guys of my race or, you know, masculine only or masculine mask. Um, and then they really kind of like frame it as like being this preference. Um, and this like exclusionary like environment is felt by like many in like queer communities, um, like this need to fit into this idea of homonormativity. And here's like a collection of like some tweets that I feel like really uh, um, <laughs> can kind of like exemplify this. Like where it's like this whole like um, attitude in this environment is like you know like felt by so many people in in like these communities. So I continued to explore some um, self portraiture in these like studio like settings where it was like tightly framed and like a nondescript like ambiguous environment, and. I was thinking about these like projections onto me and other gay people um, and like placing different objects and materials on this on on my face. Um, and I was thinking about like how like the face represents our identity and connection to others. And so like I was thinking about like these objects and materials um, interfering or changing our connection that we have with the outside world. And like a lot of these objects um, and materials were meant to suggest different aspects of like sexuality and gender, mental illness, or some other like related experiences. And I was also getting really drawn to this like sense of like absurdity and humor, playfulness and the uncanny. And I didn't really wanna provide like a concrete narrative. Like I didn't wanna like, like do like storytelling. Like I didn't wanna be like, oh, here's, here's like this story about this experience. Here's like this exact experience. Rather, I really just liked the uh, like ambiguity and, and weirdness I was able to uh, convey using, like using uh, this kind of style. Um, so after doing self-portraits for a little while, I realized I didn't wanna just like photograph myself. Like I felt like it was still too personal 
and I wanted to broaden it a little bit. Um, and then also with photographing with other people, I could have like their experiences and their narratives could also inform my work in different ways. And so because of this, my process became really collaborative, which I really admired. So in some photos, it was my ideas. Some photos, it was the ideas of the person I was photographing. But in most cases, it was like there was a lot of working back and forth and a lot of collaboration where these photo shoots were actually really playful and experimental. Um, where like we would, some, like with some of these people, we'd spend hours upon hours or like even like a couple days um, where we would just like, you know, work together and just like have these like fun processes of just like making these images. And I felt that like, coming together in this way kind of you know and like creating this thing kind of like reflected those like ideas of like community that I was thinking about. Um, I had come across the uh, concept of disidentifications by Jose Esteban Munoz which he describes as these survival strategies and practices that queer people of color or other marginalized identities use to like navigate majoritarian spaces. And Munoz recognizes that like when faced with a dominant ideology, you can either identify with it or counter identify with it. But both of these are reinforcing that ideology as the dominant ideology, right? So disidentification seeks to recycle the materials of the dominant ideology to rethink the role of the subject within that space. So I was starting to think about how I could actually utilize that concept in my work a little bit. And so I actually ended up calling the series uh, Disidentifications, which includes some of the self-portraits I did in the beginning, and then this work I was making at this time going forward. Um, and once again, I didn't necessarily want to provide like concrete narratives of disidentification, like showing these people's stories, like, oh, this is how this person is experiencing their queerness, and this is how this person is experiencing their queerness. Um, something like social documentation, like that's not really what I wanted to do. Rather, I wanted to present this image that kind of reflects these ideas of disidentification with like subjects interacting with objects in their environment in these unusual ways. Um, so like in a sense, these objects and interactions are like recycled to make these, these new experiences in these photos. Um, but also I wanted the images to like disidentify visually. So they're not really assimilating into a pure reality. So for example, it would be really weird to walk into a bathroom and see someone sitting on the toilet drinking a milkshake with a silly straw that says daddy, but it's not really out of the realm of possibility. Like it's not like supernatural. Um, and I think that's why I was like really drawn to photography in particularly is this like sense of like indexicality. So like, for example, um, I could completely make this image with like a painting or like digitally like fabricate an image, but with like traditional photography, I'm keeping that like my foot in the door of reality. Um, and I think that's also why like, I like to use the traditional visual language of photography, where it's like well lit and I'm thinking about like composition and keeping the scene true to life without like, I'm not doing any weird post-production manipulations or anything like that. So that the weirdness comes from the content of the scene rather than the treatment of the photograph. And, and for, like that for me is kind of going in hand with this concept of the uncanny or strangely familiar. So after working on this for a couple of months, I realized I was only photographing here in New York City. And I wanted to recognize that New York City isn't the only place where queer people live. Uh, and I became, concept with, I became familiar with this concept of metronormativity, which is this idea that queer people should want to live in metropolitan areas in order to be themselves and be free. And it kind of like really looks down on non-urban communities, framing them as like undesirable for queer people. Like, like these areas are unintelligent and toxic. Um, however, like queer people might not have the accessibility or even the desire to like leave these areas. And it can be really damaging to queer people to see their community in that light if that is where they feel like they like are, like if that's their community. Um, so because of this, because like I wanted to leave the city and start photographing elsewhere, um, I sought out and received a travel grant and I went to Wisconsin, Kansas, Missouri, and Pennsylvania to continue making this work. And I would stay for like a week or two and briefly become like a part of that community and meet a lot of queer people to uh, create these photos in that really collaborative process that I um, really began to admire. Um, for example, there's this one place in particular I stayed at in uh, Lawrence, Kansas. I stayed in this like co-op house that was part of this like larger network of co-op housing in the area. And it was this like 
eight or nine bedroom house and they had an extra room where they let me stay for about two weeks and everyone who lived there uh, identified as queer and and then there was even more queer people that were like coming and going it was this like hub of like uh, of you know queer people and because um uh i was like staying there uh you know i was like being like immersed in this community and engaging in this collaborative process um and because I was actually like living there with them, I was able to have these like, really spontaneous photo shoots um, rather than like plan something that felt like more rigid and, and structured and just kind of have like really these like spontaneous photo shoots where we can have like engage in that playful experimental process and, you know, um, and, you know, and kind of almost like free association thinking to like get to like make some of these images in the moment. Uh, one thing, like, also I realized I was using a lot of references to childhood, um, and I began to, uh, to embrace that as well because I was thinking of how that can actually emphasize, like, the sense of playfulness and fluidity, and also kind of recalls this idea of, like, innocence versus sexuality. And also thinking about, like, imagination and role play, performativity, and how, like, that can all, like, tie into, like, these ideas of disidentification as well. And I was also like making connections to pitch and camp, like with this like humor, tackiness, exaggeration, and this like repurposing of like banality or, you know, these like everyday objects. And for me, this like, this like repurposing of, of these like objects is kind of like going in hand with that, you know, like recycling of these ideas and these materials into something else. So after working on that uh, on disidentifications for a year, I uh, wanted to experiment. This was like about a year ago. I wanted to um, begin experimenting with, um, well, a little more than a year ago, uh, with like video and performance while I was working on editing down the photos I had already shot. There's all there's always this like performative aspect to my work, and I wanted to see what I could do with it in like a time based medium, like in ways that I couldn't do with photography. Uh, so I, I made this video called Makeup Tutorial uh, last summer in uh, 2019. I'm going to show this one minute excerpt. There's no audio or anything, but Zoom is really, really, really bad at showing video. So I'm going to play it on here, but sometimes it can be like really laggy and glitchy. So I'm going to drop a Vimeo link in the chat. Um, so if you want to watch it on uh, Vimeo. There. It's just the same. It's a one minute excerpt from like a, a video that's like three and a half minutes. I'm gonna go ahead and play, the, play this excerpt. Um, so I was, um, actually let's play again. So I was originally thinking of like these like <laughs> expectations of like hyper femininity or hyper masculinity that are, uh, that can be placed on, um, onto, uh, queer people. Um, and I also like, I was used, utilizing this like language of a makeup tutorial that's like really trendy on YouTube and Instagram and also kind of like referencing drag. And it's kind of like using these to reimagine it into something else with this uh, while also using like humor and absurdity. Um, I've actually also like adapted this piece into a live performance, particularly a live collaborative performance with Stephen Baboon, who introduced me today, um, which we did for the first time at the Pingyao Photo Festival this last September. 
um, where we brought kind of like these like different performative aspects of our work together. Um, so in his work, he touches on his like, experiences with his queerness and cultural identity, and it contains a lot of interactions between the body and fabric. Uh, so in this piece, I use the handheld mirror and markers to apply this like fake makeup to myself uh, in the same way as, as the video I just showed, um, while Steven wraps fabric around himself. And then after putting a blank piece of fabric on his face, I drew the makeup on that piece of fabric while he tied pieces of fabric to my arms and kind of like representing like the connection between these like aspects of our identity and how we explore it in our work. And here's like, a, here's just another shot just like a little bit more context of the space we were in. So after like, I did, there's a couple like other videos I did and like some other things I did where I was just kind of like experimenting with different things. Um, but then I decided after a couple months, I want to go back to photography. Um, so this last February, I traveled to Chicago for the College Art Association Conference. Uh, and I stayed in this Airbnb that was absolutely filled with mirrors. There were entire walls that were just mirrors and the bathroom had mirrors on so many surfaces on every surface so like you could see yourself from every angle when you're in very vulnerable positions and like also like as i was in chicago and i'm going to downtown chicago every day i'm passing by this giant bean shaped mirror that's just like hanging out that also kind of has this like bodily shape and becomes this you know spectacle um so I was constantly like seeing myself and seeing my body and facing with myself and like this idea of, you know, like reflection and, and seeing um, and like spectacle. And um, I began to think about like what originally made me feel like an outlier among gay men, which was my body. Uh, and so I started to kind of think about this like connection between like um, corporate reality and queerness. And so this was the first photo I took in that Airbnb. I really didn't like seeing my body that much. It was making me think of this like not good relationship I have with my body. And so like in this photo, I used the edges of this mirror to like slice my body into pieces while also like obscuring my face with like the reflection of like the smudges and touches on the mirror. And I was thinking about how this like reflected self image can kind of play a role in like relationships, particularly um, as a gay man. And I was also thinking um, at this time of like these like smaller sub communities that do fetishize like different types of bodies. Like there's like apps and websites and, and stuff like that that are completely dedicated to those who are attracted to like fat gay men. But I personally feel like that isn't a super well fit solution for me because it's still like assimilating into those expectations that you're only valid as a gay man if you can you know, if you can be sexualized. And that is, you know, how you find your, your belonging is your ability for your body to be sexualized. And so um, in my research, I came across this, this concept of body neutrality, which is this response to body positivity that has emerged in recent years. And it focuses on the acceptance of your body as is rather than like a love of your body and recognizing that, it, that, that it's still like, better than feeling disgust or rejection of your body. So like body positivity can put like a lot of pressure on people to feel beautiful. Um, and body positivity shouldn't be the only antidote to negative feelings of your body. So like it's still useful and it still works for many people, but there's like, like many people who, you know, if they are feeling negatively towards their body, maybe can't meet up to that expectation of like, no, you have to feel beautiful. You have to feel sexy. Like, can't it just be enough to just be like, you know what, it is what it is, and I'm just a human, and this is my human body, and that's still, you know, that should be enough, right? So here's actually this, like, <laughs> Tumblr post <laughs> that I think puts body neutrality in a nice perspective. Um, uh, I'll read it here. Uh, it says, look, I don't think my stretch marks are beautiful. I don't think they're tiger stripes or natural tattoos. I don't think my acne is beautiful. I don't think the bags under my eyes are beautiful. I think they're just human. And I don't think I have to be beautiful all the time in order to be accepted and loved and successful. I don't think every small detail of my outer appearance needs to be translated into prettiness. Um, which I was like, when I, like, when I found out, I was like, wow, that's like exactly, you know, what this is talking about. And so like body neutrality recognizes that we don't need to feel that pressure to see parts of ourselves as, as beautiful or sexy in order to feel valid. Um, I was also thinking about like, th this is like something like more recently thinking about 
Um, some of these like narratives that we see online, like on social media with like people with disabilities or chronic conditions, particularly like a common one is like skin conditions. Um, and these narratives, these like stories are referred to as inspiration porn because they have this like goal of inspiring normative individuals by showcasing this individual who overcomes their disability or condition. So like a lot of these uh, narratives are in this like video form and they begin with a person, uh, this like person with like disability or condition performing a very basic normative task. Like a really common example one is someone brushing their teeth. And they're like, for example, they'll show this person that has like a different range of mobility engaging in this task that's equally as mundane for them, but we're meant to feel inspired by this person because they're able to overcome their disability or overcome their lack of mobility and brush their teeth. And that's supposed to be like amazing to us and that we're supposed to see them as inspirational. Um, and like a lot of these stories end with the individual being seen through these like conventional standards of beauty and that is why they're valid. For example, like a lot of them end by showing that you know, despite their disability or despite their, their scars or their burns, they became a successful model or an online makeup artist, as if like that is the ideal end goal for people with non-normative bodies. Like that is what they should strive to be and want to like assimilate into these ideas of conven conventional beauty. So in thinking about like body neutrality, um, I wanted to look at like different parts of my body, eventually some other people's bodies that aren't necessarily like sightly or appealing um, but I didn't want to show them as gross. Like I wasn't trying to do something similar to abject art where I'm, you know, trying to like incite this like horror response or this like gross response. But I also don't want to show them as beautiful. Like I don't want to be like, oh, like my scars are beautiful. My skin is beautiful. And I'm just kind of like showing them more neutral. Um, so here's like a close up uh, image of a scar with one of my scars. And I almost want it to be like something, like the image that you would see when you look up scar in an encyclopedia. Like this could be like the reference image for that entry. Or like appealing sunburn, for example, where it's just kind of this like neutral perspective. And it can still be like aesthetically pleasing photographs. And I'm like paying attention to lighting and composition. So they can be like beautiful or pretty in that sense but I'm not trying to comment on like the validity, validity of the person through their ability to be like conventionally beautiful. So um, I began referring to this body of work, which starts with the, the photos I did in the Chicago Airbnb up in Including Means. Um, I began referring to this body of work as ad corpus, which is this play on the phrase ad hominem, which translates to, um, to the person in Latin. And is this like, um, argument fallacy when you attack a person rather than their argument like if someone you know makes an argument against something and instead of actually addressing their argument you just try to undermine the person say well you're just you know whatever you don't you don't know what you're talking about or whatever so I replaced hominem which is like person with corpus which is body and thinking about like you know these attacks on the body rather than the argument or the person and how like that is like the you know the center of attention and so like going forward, so like, uh, like as, as I mentioned, like I just finished my MFA this week. Um, and so like going forward, I'm gonna kind of like expand upon this a little bit, I think. And, and um, one thing I've, I've been like stuck with myself and in like familiar environments, like as many of us have been, you know, in social distancing in this new normal, I hate that phrase. Um, and I'm, I'm excited to finally be able to um, like develop this further and photographing other people and like in other environments rather than just like myself or like the very close like um, circle of friends that I'm able to see every once in a while. Um, and I want to see like how this can change like through the rest of COVID and then also post COVID like what I can do with this as well. Um, and I am thinking there's like a couple like uh, I, I am thinking I'm going to like revisit video too. Um, there's a couple like of ideas of videos and like a little bit of shooting I've done while in quarantine to um, uh, and, and kind of like explore what I can do with video while looking at this like corporate corporate reality of like queerness uh, and what I can do with that in video. Um, so yeah, that's what I have. Here's my website and Instagram again. Um, please like, you know, keep in touch, give me a follow, um, follow my work. Um, 
and yeah, so I'd, I'd uh, love to hear any questions or if anyone has any thoughts or anything like that. And we, uh, 